Well, they need to make sure they told you. Because that might be interesting more. Might be. So anyway, got that going on tomorrow. And then uh, Friday and Saturday, we're going to be watching God's Not Dead 2. Tracy and I watched it last night. And it was, uh, it was good the second time. I'm going to enjoy it the third time. So I encourage you to come out on, uh, yeah, come on up. It's all right. Come on. <laughs> he pointed. I was like, hey, come on up. The water's fine. Uh, so we got that going on Friday and Saturday night, 6.30 each night. Uh, it be taking place, so I encourage you to come up for that. And there's a nursery. Wow, that's all we got going on. Cool. So we got a couple of um, uh, prayer requests. We need to remember, uh, of course, we want to remember Peggy. Uh, she had a rough time in her recovery today, but she did get to come home this evening. So she's uh, at home. At, Mike says she's sitting up on the sitting up on the couch and is able to get up, and move around a little bit. So we thank the Lord for that. So uh, just continue to pray for her uh, continued uh, uh, recovery. And then uh, Tracy, uh, my little sister, uh, dealing with some issues with her pregnancy, so please remember her. And then remember Ola Deal. Uh, as we told you, she had that mass on her brain, and then Johnny Mace uh, is dealing with uh, his issue with uh, his blood. They're not really sure what's going on there. Uh, also remember Susan, this issue with the migraines, and I think Tracy got a message the other day that the insurance company been kind of jerking around a little bit. So uh, did she get it done today? All right. She got the the – the workup done for the insurance? Or, oh, she had the treatments done today. Okay, cool. All right. So remember Susan. That God was just touching this and minister to that. And uh, Betty Jo Hoffman uh, dealing with stomach cancer. And uh, Destiny Mashburn, as I told you, remember her, 15 years old, dealing with this uh, disorder called POTS. Then Terry Dornbush is dealing with lung cancer. And Peggy's on there twice. And uh, Sister Jeanette's on there. And uh, she's doing good. So we thank the Lord for that. And Jim, uh, remember him, he'll be having a colonoscopy on Monday. And uh, God will touch him and minister to him. And then remember the Swink family, Alan and Lord, uh, that God will touch them and uh, minister to them as they're dealing with uh, lymphoma and the brain cancer. Uh, Pat Carpenter is dealing with heart issues. Please remember her, if you will. Continue with Octavius, who's dealing with family issues. Rodney Hayes, who's in need of a financial breakthrough. And then Greg Howington, who is dealing with sugar diabetes. And then Vera Hubbard, who has a tumor on the brain. And Mike. Uh, he has to go in for some testing on Friday. They're going to be doing a uh, stress test on him, uh, trying to figure out what's going on with him. He's been having some, some I want to say blackouts, but he said it's kind of like he, he, he blacks out forward, but he can see peripherally. So they're not real sure what's going on. But uh, they've, they've done some other testing on him, but he's got some more he's got to do uh, Friday. So remember him for that. Continue to remember Brianna Guy, uh, who's also uh, pregnant. And then we have some that are going back to school. Matter of fact, today was Kelsey's first day at school. And, uh, so uh, we're missing her at the house. But uh, remember her and all these that are going back to school. And then we got our, our t high schoolers and uh, middle schoolers and uh, elementary age are going back Monday. Uh, they start back Monday. So remember them as they go back to school. And then uh, uh, she don't have this one on there. But I, I want to ask you to pray for uh, Christian. Uh, we had a little incident at the house today. She uh, hopped on the tractor and was going across the field to go and take care of the goats. And her dog that she's had for nine years, she run over it. And uh, y'all have heard me talk about freckles. And uh, she killed freckles today. So her 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 heart is ripped today. Uh, so remember, remember Christian, if you will, I, I, and that God would just touch her. She called me, and all she did, when she called me, she was on she was way across the field, and she called me, and I was walking out the back door, and she was just sobbing, and I couldn't understand a thing she said. And I was just saying, hold on, baby, I'll be right there. And Tracy saw me running. And I went running through the field, and all of a sudden I saw Tracy coming up behind me. And uh, we got over there, and she's just sitting there on the ground uh, holding her and uh, just sobbing. And, um, so, you know, you get attached to those animals. And uh, Christian, if most of you all know, she is an animal lover. And uh, Freckles was her favorite. And uh, so uh, that was pretty hard on her today. That happened just this afternoon. So please remember her. Uh, it, that God would just touch her and straighten her. I can only imagine what she's dealing with. But uh, we're just praying the Lord would touch her and minister her. So, uh, any other spoken requests? Yeah. Wow. All right. So, remember Carol. He, that's a witness stepdad. So, remember him, if you will. Do you have something, man? Okay. All right. Nancy's got some testing coming up. She's got uh, 
heart testing. That's about the best way you can put it up there. Anything else spoken? All right. Anything unspoken on that? God knows. He knows. Let's pray together. Ask God to have his way. <clears throat> then we're going to get right into the, the book of Hebrews again in chapter 10. And uh, we're going to dig a little bit further and see what the writer's speaking to us. So let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, I, I just want to say you, you have demonstrated your loving and your kindness time and time again. And it's so awesome just to be called your son. And I thank you for that. I thank you, Lord, that I have been bought with a price and I am not my own, but I am yours. I'm glad to know today that the devil is defeated over my life and over my home and over my family, over ministry, over this church. The enemy is defeated because no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Thank you today, Lord, that we stand in victory because of you, because of what you've done. And one day, our ultimate victory is coming, that we'll be raptured out of this world and get to be at home with you, Lord. It's going to be worth it all. For today, God, we understand that this light momentary affliction is working for us a far exceeding great reward. And I just pray tonight, God, that you would touch every heart and every life of each and every person. Help us to understand and realize, God, what we have in you. Help us to understand and realize, God, what great strengths and victory and peace and joy we find in you. And, God, it all comes in you, God. We bless your name tonight. I thank you, Father, that we can call upon your name. We thank you for those that have been touched even today, for Peggy, Lord, that you've gotten her home and she's able to recover and everything's going well for her. And I just pray, God, that you would just do a complete recovery in her life. For these that have testing coming up, for Mike and for Nancy, for Brother Jim, God, I pray that you would touch them and minister to them and move in these testings that are coming up and these procedures that they have. God, that you would just be glorified through every situation. Father, for, for the other needs on our list and, and those that are dealing with cancers and, and, and sicknesses and illnesses, Lord, we just pray for healing in their bodies in the name of Jesus. God, knowing that we call upon you and that you hear us and that you answer, Lord. I want to thank you one more time, God, that your ear is open to our cry. God, that you hear us and that you answer us. And that while we're even asking, the answer's on the way. And you, have, you know what we have need of even before we ask it. I want to be a little selfish right now, God, and ask you to touch my baby. Minister to her. Give her peace and strength that she's in the fellowship of her brothers and sisters in Christ in her class tonight, God. I pray that she would find rest in you to know, God, that you're in control and that you're sovereign. And that you saw all things that happened today and that you're going to grant peace and mercy to her. I pray, God, that your will be done. God, let her be encouraged in you to know that you're her Savior, you're her Lord. I pray that you will move in her life and strengthen her today. Father, bless us this time as we go into your word. Help us to do all we do to do it for your glory. We give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. Touch me tonight, God. I need a touch in my body. I need strength, God. I need uh, strength in my throat, strength in my body. I just pray, God, that you minister to me in the name of Jesus. Help me to do the work that you've sent me here to do tonight. Help us to understand the finality of this sacrifice that Christ has done. Just the sheer awesomeness of the sacrifice that it has never been done before and it does not need to be done again. Help us to recognize that tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse 11. We're going to read down through the 18th verse. Oh, it's so good. I've been asked about the insurance. I haven't heard anything yet. So... Of course, if y'all not heard me shouting or running around or anything, you, you know I haven't heard anything yet. But we're still believing. Uh, matter of fact, Dr. Voris called me today. He said, son, I was talking to the overseer, and he was worried about you. I said, okay. He said, <laughs> he, said he doesn't know what, what's, what they're going to do about this building. I said, well, well, we don't either. We're just trusting for the insurance. He said, I ain't think about insurance. I said, well, that's what we pay all that money every year for. About $6,000 a year is what we pay. So, hey, that's what we pay the, pay the money for. And, Something goes wrong, they fix it, right? So, anyway, I just told them to pray that uh, that, that will come through. So, we're looking forward to for what God does. So, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, begin with verse 11. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he had said before, this is the covenant 
that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. So I want to talk to you tonight for just a few moments about the final sacrifice. The final sacrifice. Bless your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, the writer to the Hebrews, and, and you'll notice that all throughout this particular letter, he is, he is continually trying to reestablish his point about the supremacy of the sacrifice of Jesus. And, and it might seem like we're repeating ourselves as we continue to study this, but the reason we're repeating ourselves is because the writer to the Hebrews is repeating himself, and he's trying to drive the point home, the supremacy of what Christ did compared to what they did under the Levitical law. And so here he is again drawing a series of implicit contrasts between the sacrifice that Jesus offered and the animal sacrifices that the priest offered. Number one, he, has, he stresses the achievements of Jesus, the achievement of Jesus. The sacrifice of Jesus was made once and is effective forever. Ever. In other words, what Jesus did on Calvary was good enough. And when he declared it to be finished, it was finished. There was no, there's no more, there was no more need for animal sacrifices. And this is the point that he's driving home. The animal sacrifices of the priests, they had to be made over and over again. Even then, they were not effective in any real way. As a matter of fact, it tells us in verse 11 that, that they offered those sacrifices, but they, they could never take the sins away. And so this is the point that he's trying to drive home. So every day, as long as the temple stood, there were sacrifices that had to be carried out. We find these sacrifices in Numbers chapter 28. Numbers chapter 28, beginning with verse 3. He said, you shall say to them, this is the offering made by fire, which you shall offer to the Lord. Two male lambs in their first year without blemish, day by day, and as a regular burnt offering. The one lamb you shall offer in the morning, the other lamb you shall offer in the evening. So twice a day there were sacrifices being made. And one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour as a grain offering mixed with one-fourth of a hen of pressed oil. So there was a food offering. There was a burnt offering. There was a food offering. It is a regular burnt offering which was ordained at Mount Sinai for a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord, verse 7. And it's drink offering. So they had a, they had a burnt offering, they had a food offering, and they had a drink offering. The drink offering was one-fourth of a hen for each lamb. In a holy place you shall pour out the drink to the Lord as an offering. The other lamb you shall offer in the evening as the morning grain offering and its drink offering, you shall offer it as an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. So every morning and every evening, they would take a male lamb that was one years old, that was without spot, without blemish, and it was offered as the burnt offering. So along with that, there was offered a food offering, which consisted again of the one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with a quarter of a hem of pure oil. So that measure of flour was, was equivalent to about three liters of flour, but, and the oil was about a liter of oil. And so they would mix the together and offered as an offering to God. There was a drink offering which consisted of a quarter of a hen of wine. And added that, there was a daily food offering of the high priest. It consisted, it consisted of one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil and it was baked in a fat, uh, flat pan. They would take half of that cake, if you will, and they would offer it in the morning and then the other half they would do it in the evening. So in addition to that, there was an offering of incense before these offerings in the morning and after them in the evening. So there was this kind of uh, priestly treadmill of sacrifice that was taking place, how they were continually having to do sacrifices throughout the day. And all this was for the purposes of maintaining the right relationship with God. It was ordained, it was spoken to by God, this is what they were to do. And so every day there were sacrifices that were taking place. But the sad part about it is, again in verse 11, it said that no matter how much they sacrificed, it did nothing to take care of of sins. And so in this in, in one man's commentary by the name of John Maffet, he speaks of the Levitical drudges who day in and day out kept offering these sacrifices. There was no end to this process. And it left people still conscious of their sin and still alienated from God. So as long as they were doing these blood sacrifices, as long as they were doing these burnt offerings and these food offerings, and they were having to go through all this routine and all this ritual, the only thing that it did, as we studied about in, in, in the earlier verses, the only thing that it did, it would bring to their minds their sinful nature but it did nothing to deal with their sinful nature. They were always conscious of the fact that they were alienated from God. So in contrast, Jesus made a sacrifice that neither, neither could nor be repeated. And neither could nor be repeated. I want to take the first one first. It could not be repeated. There is something unrepeatable about any great work. 
Think about this for a moment. It, you, can, you can take uh, any, any tune or any song and you can repeat it or, you know, there's remakes today of some of the old stuff that was back in the 60s and the 70s and they take it and they make it better and, or, or they improve on it or they use today's technology and enhance it or, or, or they change it around and shift it a little bit or, you know, there's things that's always done. But there's some works that cannot be remade. There's some works that cannot be re- recreated because they were great in what they did. Think about Beethoven or Mozart or some of these right, uh, some of these uh, music compositions that they did that just that just transcend history. They're still they're still what they were at that time. They still are the same in their greatness today. So there was there's no repeating of that. And so one echoes another in these these modern day tunes. But it's not possible to repeat these great works. No one else will ever write anything like them. It's re- it's possible to repeat some kinds of poetry or or, or, or that's written in, in in magazines or on Christmas cards. But to 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 sit down and try to repeat or rewrite verses of Shakespeare uh, or, 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 or some other guys like Homer's Iliad or some of, the, some of these things just simply stand alone. Certain things cannot be repeated, but all works of genius have a certain unrepeatable quality. And I said all that to say this. It's the same way with what Jesus did on the cross. A, a, an animal sacrifice cannot replicate what Jesus did for us. A, a, a priest going into a, a temple and trying to offer up these ephahs of flour and all the it cannot replicate or cannot outdo what Christ did. Once he did it and once it was done, it was sufficient in what he did. So it could not be repeated. It, it is unique. It is one of those masterpieces which can never be done again. You just stand in awe when you begin to think about it. It's like the Mona Lisa. You can draw another lady standing there with some, and I'm going to say it the way I see it, with some dumb look on her face. You know, you can try to redraw something like that, but it's not going to change the fact that the Mona Lisa is one of a kind. There is absolutely no no repeating of that. It's the same way with the sacrifice of what Jesus did. When I think about the cross, as the psalmist said, when I survey the wondrous cross, when I think about the beauty of the cross, when I think about the power of the cross, and I think about the glory of God and what He did, I'm telling there's absolutely nothing that compares to the greatness of that moment. Absolutely nothing compares to the six hours on that Friday that Jesus willingly took the nails in His hands and His feet and was sacrificed to finish once and for all the sacrificial system of the work of God that it would no longer need to be repeated. It could not be repeated and it needed not to be repeated. For one thing, the sacrifice of Jesus perfectly shows the love of God. In that life of service and in that death of love, there stands fully displayed the heart of God. See, it's basically Jesus saying to us, this is what God is like. He loves you so much that I'm putting my life down for your life. I'm taking your sin that you don't have to live in that wretchedness anymore. I, I'm, 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 being, I'm being shattered and broken so that you can find healing and peace and joy. This is what God's like. What is more, the life and death of Jesus was an act of perfect obedience. We talked about this last week. Perfect obedience, and not only perfect obedience, but it was perfect sacrifice. Perfect sacrifice. And see, all of Scripture at its deepest declares that the only sacrifice that God desires is obedience. God just wants us to be obedient to Him. And this is the beauty of what Jesus did. Jesus broke in that Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was, was, was broken before God. And in that garden, He relented His will to the will of the Father. He declared with blood streaming down His face, God, not my will be done, but Thy will be done. Think about that prayer for just a moment. We, we Listen, let's, let's just go ahead and all be honest here. There is a war that we all fight with the flesh. The human side of us, the the, the, the error side of us, the, the fallen side of us, we battle with. Jesus was perfect in all his ways. The Bible said there was no sin in him. There was no guile found in his mouth. There was nothing about him. But yet there was still a wrestling match going on inside of Jesus between humanity and obeying the will of God to the point that his body, his physical body responded. In the way that he was in so much agony that capillaries began to burst in his head and those sweat became as drops of blood. Think about that. And, 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 and you, wonder, you wonder what it is like when we're wrestling 
trying to find the purpose and the will of God for our life. Jesus knew what his purpose was. He had already testified that this was going to happen. But when it came to that critical moment, there was still a wrestling match inside that body that was declaring, Lord, I- I'm asking you if it's your will, let this cup pass from me, God. If it's your will, God, let this thing, tra- don't, don't let this thing. God, if you can let this moment pass by, then let it pass by. But he broke. There was something that broke inside of him that he declared, Lord, nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will be done. Listen, I know he was strong. I know that he was captivating when he'd walk into a room. People look at him and the anointing that rested on his life. And we see with such boldness and such vigor how he would approach situation after situation. How he would confront the religious of the time, especially those that brought the woman caught in adultery and they threw at his feet. And how he, he, he boldly confronted them without any fear. Listen, he was right down at the ground with her. They could have started throwing stones and would have been rightfully so under the Old Testament covenant to stone her to death. But he stood there, right there in the dirt next to her and, and, and vigorously faced and confronted the religious of that day. We see how he would walk into the temple and rage would enter in him when he saw what they were doing to the house of God. He would take the, the, the whips and, and, and kick the tables over and whip and chase the money, change it out of there and declare, my house shall be called a house of prayer. We see all the, the strength and the vigor and the, and, and the just, uh, just the intensity with which Jesus served the Father. But here we see him at this most critical moment of all of history. He's wrestling within himself to the point again that his body is reacting Acting in the way that it's reacting. And he's struggling with this moment. And, and we can paint the picture of this big strong Jesus. Just saying some kind of simple prayer in the garden. But I don't believe it was that easy on the human side. Because now he's taken upon your sin. My sin. All the sins of eternity. And at this critical moment. He's having to make the decision. Jesus is having to anguish over this moment. But declare to the Father. Father it is your will that I submit to. And this sacrifice of obedience. This perfect sacrifice once and for all to settle the whole matter. It did not need to be repeated. See, he declared that the only sacrifice God desires is obedience. And it's in the life and death of Jesus. That's precisely the sacrifice that God received. See, perfection cannot be improved on. Which is perfect is right. I mean, you, you, you can't fix perfect. People say you can't fix stupid, but you can't fix perfect either, you know. So, so you, you, once it's there, you don't want to you don't want to mess with it. You don't want to touch it. You know, perfection cannot be improved on. In Jesus, there is one and at the same time the perfect re- revelation of God, the perfect revelation of God, the perfect offering of obedience. One at the same time, it's revealing to us who God is, and secondly, re- revealing to us what it is to be perfectly obedient. So, a sacrifice cannot, and it needs not ever be made again. But the priest, they go on and on with their weary routines and animal sacrifices. But the sacrifice of Christ was made once and for all. Number two, number one, number one, let me remind you, he stressed the achievement of Jesus. Number two, he stressed the exaltation of Jesus. See, it's with care that he chooses his word, but the priest stands offering sacrifice But the Bible said that Christ sat at the right hand of God. He sat at the right hand of God. Think about this for just a moment. I I was listening to a minister not too long ago, and he he, he made the statement. He said, as long as the priest were, uh, were responsible for the sacrifices, they never sat down. But at the conclusion of their sacrifices, when their work had been completed, that's when they had the ability and the opportunity to sit down. See, what Jesus did, once he offered himself once and for all, once Jesus had hung himself on that cross and he laid his life down willingly, when he was ascended at the completion of his sacrifice, he sat down as if to declare once again, as he'd already declared from the cross, it is finished. Can I tell you tonight, folks, that there is no more need for sacrifices. There is no more need for the breaking of a body. There is no more need for this because Jesus, once and for all, on Calvary's hill was broken so that you and I can have life and have it more abundantly. What Jesus did was sufficient. He declared unto Paul when Paul was dealing with the the thorn in the flesh. He said, listen, my grace is sufficient for you. What I did on Calvary's hill is good enough to fix you today. Can I tell you that 
that the same grace that was sufficient for Paul in his day is the same grace that is sufficient for us today. The power of God's grace transcends time and transcends history. It still reaches into the lowest parts of the earth and can grab the wretched sinner's heart and set that man or woman free. God's grace and mercy still has the ability to arrest the drug addict's heart and liberate them and deliver them for the glory of God. My God, he could still set a prostitute free. He still can put broken marriages back together. He still can call a wayward child home. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood and the grace of God. I come to tell you tonight that God's grace is sufficient. It's sufficient. There is something powerful about what Jesus did. It does not ever need to be repeated again. It cannot be repeated. And it does not need to be repeated. He sat down at the right hand of God. See, when the priest is standing, they're standing in the position of servant. But when he's seated, he's seated in the position of royalty. Glory to God. See, Jesus is the king who has come home. He went, he fought, he finished, and he was able to sit down in complete victory. Can I tell you that as long as we're aligned with Christ, as long as we're lined up with His Word, as long as we're obedient to His call, can I tell you the same victory that He experienced on that day is victory for us. Victory over death. Victory over the grave. Victory over sin. Victory over the powers of hell. Victory over the devil. Thank God that I've got victory over Satan. He is defeated. Jesus came out holding the keys of death and hell. He has the authority and He sat down in all His glory and all his power Jesus sat down to declare I finished my work I finished it his task was accomplished his victory was won and there is a wholeness about the life of Jesus to, to which we ought to probably give more thought his life is incomplete without his death his death is incomplete without his resurrection his resurrection is incomplete without him returning to glory. It is the same Jesus who lived and died and rose again. That same Jesus is now seated at the right hand of God. That same Jesus. Listen, Paul reiterates this. When he's again talking about the resurrection, he said, If there is no resurrection, then Christ died in vain. But the resurrection is, is our hope. It's, it's what gives us our expectation. It's what gives us our understanding. When Jesus did what he did, again, it brought finality to the powers of death and hell over our lives. We don't have to worry about going to a holding chamber. We don't have to about worry about going to some upper CEO of Abraham's bosom and having to wait there to be preached deliverance to. When Jesus was in the tomb, his spirit descended into hell and he preached deliverance to those that were captive and he released those that were there and he set them free. And now because of that, when we go to the grave, Paul declared to be absent in body is to be present with the Lord. Can I tell you tonight, we ought to be the happiest people in all the world to know that if I live, it's Christ. But if I die, it's God. Thank God that death has been defeated and victory is mine. And I'm an overcomer of the grave and hell and death and the devil. And I stand tonight in complete victory over everything that the enemy would try to bring against me. That no weapon formed against me shall prosper. For greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. My God, he's given me the victory to overcome. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. That same Jesus is seated, interceding, talking to the Father on mine and your behalf. He is not simply a saint who lived a lovely life. Not simply a martyr who died a heroic death. Not simply a risen figure who returned to keep company with his friends. He is the Lord of glory. Whew. He's the Lord of glory. His life is like a paneled tapestry. And, 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 and to look at one panel is to see only a little bit of the story. But the beauty of the scriptures and the gospels is that it brings everything together so that we can see the whole picture. You know, if you'd have just saw Jesus in the Christmas story, you'd have thought, oh, how sweet. That's nice. That's lovely. And you'd have oohed and aahed and, and gone on and on the way we do over babies. 
And, and that would have been the end of the story. You just saw that one panel and you just thought, that's it. I, I, I wish we had more revelation into the panel of the teenage years. Anybody with me? I'd kind of like to know what went on with Jesus in the teenage years. We do know at one point that they go and, and he's found teaching and answering and talking questions with the wise people at that time. And, 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 and uh, I hate to even say it this way, but, you know, his mama says, what you doing? He said, don't you know what? What I'm supposed to be doing, it's got to be about my father's business. And, and the Bible said that, you know, after he got through that little moment there, he went back and was subject to his parents until his time had come. And listen, we don't, we don't know a whole lot about his teenage years. You know, if you've, I, I, you know, mine, mine are about out of teenage years. But when you go through those teenage years and you're raising those teenagers, you just wonder what kind of, what kind of teenager Jesus was, you know. But they really didn't differentiate all that stuff. They didn't look at it from the teen perspective. You know, when you turned 13, you became a man, you know. And they did their ceremony, and you, you, you just moved on up into manhood. But, but anyway, but when you look at that tapestry of the Christmas story, you think, ooh, wow, that's pretty, that's nice, that's sweet. And we celebrate that once a year. And if you looked at the tapestry of, or the panel of the tapestry of his life, if you just looked at it, it is, it is ministry time. You'd think, wow, what a great man. That's awesome. That was great for what he did in that time in history. If you looked at his death, and, and as most of us probably have, have kind of visualized it, especially with the passion of the Christ, and looking at that, that, that one section of, of his life and his death and the beating and the brutality of what he went through, and you look at that and you say, wow, man, that's horrific. I can't believe that that, that, that happened that way. But see, you can't look at it in parts. When you begin to see it from the perspective of the whole and you see the plan of God, how God just demonstrated his power, how God demonstrated his sovereignty, that he chose that moment in history, that moment in time that our calendar even rests on. Our calendar even rests on. it. God shifted something so awesome in history that even our calendar rests on it. But when you look at the whole perspective from his birth to his life to his ministry to his death, to his burial, to his resurrection, to his ascension, to the dissension of the Holy Ghost coming down and empowering the people of God. All this great stuff that happened, all this stuff that tried, when you look at the whole panel of the life of Christ and what God was able to fulfill and bring to pass just for you and I. And if you, if you think about it, it was all done in about the span of three and a half years in all actuality when you consider ministry and the effectiveness of ministry, and the death and the resurrection of Christ. Look how much he accomplished in three and a half years that John said if everything was written down, the books of the world couldn't contain it. In three and a half years. I, I, I look back, and I've got about three and a half of my years of my life I'd like to have back. That was wasted, running, disobedient. Felt like Jonah running around in my great big fish that God was finally saying, okay, there's coming a day he's going to vomit you up. You're going to quit running. You're going to do what I told you to do. Now, I know none of y'all have lived that. Y'all, y'all, all y'all done y'all thing right from the get-go. But boy, I, I, if you look back on my life, it's a mess. But thank God for his grace. Thank God for the extension of mercy that's renewed every day. Amen? Glory to God. So, 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 so we see a little bit of the story, but the tapestry has to be looked at the whole before the full greatness is disclosed. When you begin to look at it whole, and you see how God just miraculously worked, One thing right after the other. And everything fell right into place. And God worked it out just like he said he would. I was speaking with a lady, and I'm going to get to my final point here in just a second. But I was speaking to a lady at a restaurant the other day, and her son is getting ready to be deployed to Iraq. She was beside herself. I think this is her only son. She was already beside herself that he joined the military. But then after joining the military, he get his deployment papers, and he's going to Iraq. She was was so, so distraught. So distraught. So I begin to minister. I begin to witness to her, talk to her about the Lord. And I, I share with her some facts, some known facts that have happened right now, uh, just to kind of ease her mind a little bit. I said, you realize that just in Chicago, Illinois, in this year, we've lost more people to murder and gun violence in Chicago this year than we've lost in, lost in Afghanistan in the last three and a half years. Just this year, there's been over 450 murders in Chicago. And we've not lost near that many on the battlefield in Afghanistan in the last three and a half years. So I, I was trying to let her know, listen, you're, you're worried about him because he's going to another country and it sends this parallel thing. But I want to tell you something. He's going to be all right there. Uh, but number two, I, 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 I shifted a little bit. I said, listen, I want you to understand something. Her name's Melody. I said, Melody, I want, I want you to understand something. 
I said, man, I want, you, I, want you to, I want you to think back over times of your life when you were so stressed and you were so overwhelmed with a moment. And in that moment, I want you to think, when you were sitting there thinking to yourself, I'm going to never get through this. I'm never going to make it through this. And she began to talk about moments that, that she had those times. And she said, you know what? I'm still here. And I'm still alive. And I'm still upright. And I can still give glory to God. And I said, that's right. And guess what? This moment that you're in right now, it's going to pass also. And it may, listen, I'm not going to sit here and tell you, listen, he could die on a plane crash going across the sea, going to Iraq. You don't know what's going to happen. He could die in, in the barracks before he even gets on the plane. We don't know what's going to happen. He may come back and outlive all of us. We don't know what's going to happen. But I do know this, that God is still sovereign. And the same God that I feel in this restaurant, it's the same God that will be protecting your son in Iraq. She said, he's got a relationship with God. I said, that's all that matters. If he'll keep that first and foremost, and he'll look to God there. Listen, I'm telling you, if a bullet pierced his heart, he'd open up his eyes and be in glory before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I'm going to tell you, it'll all be worth it. And if he gets back home, then it's going to be okay. She's stressing over this and stressing over that. But I said, listen, I want you to understand that God is still going to get the glory. God's still fighting on your side. God's going to make it through. All you got to do is trust him and know that God is there that God is sovereign that God is over watching and that God is going to keep you just keep your trust in him she said tears streamed down her face and she said listen I'm not sad I'm just happy to know that somebody's still here to encourage me to let me know that God knows where I'm at that God's got his hand on my son's life listen that is the supremacy of what Christ can do no matter where you're at no matter what you're dealing with God is in control God is overseeing and God is not asleep at the wheel and God's going to see you through you might not think you can make it but God's already worked out a plan and he's going to complete that which he has begun in you against that day all you got to do is trust the Lord with all your heart lean not on your own understanding but in all your ways acknowledge him and God will direct your paths he's a good God he's a good God you may be in something tonight and you might be saying well, Pastor I don't know how I'm going to get through this trust the Lord trust the Lord I don't, listen, you may be fearful to even wake up tomorrow because you don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. Trust the Lord. He's already in your tomorrow, and he's already working. Amen. That thing you thought was going to kill you, he's already call, causing it to fall subservient. He's already causing it to fall down at your feet. The Bible said that a thousand fall at your left hand and ten thousand at your right. He'll make your enemies your footstool. My God, listen, I'm telling you, he'll help you to overcome because his name is riding on you. The name of King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is riding on your life. And I'm telling you, he is not going to let his name be besmirched. God's name is on you. You just keep on standing. Having done all to stand, as he told that Moses, he said, stand still and see the the salvation of the Lord. I'm telling you, don't matter what tomorrow brings, God's already holding your tomorrow and He's already there fighting for you to get you through a clear path. All you got to do is trust Him. Trust Him. God's going to see you through. Number three. Number three. He talked about the achievement. He talked about the achievement. He talked about the, the exaltation. And finally, He talks about the final triumph of Jesus. The final triumph. See, he awaits the final overcoming of his enemies. In the end, there comes a, 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 a city, a universe, if you will, where Christ will reign supreme. Listen, there's coming a day that all this hell and all this stuff and all this chaos and all this stuff that's going on, all that stuff, Jesus is going to establish his kingdom. I guess y'all ain't fighting like I'm fighting. That's enough to get excited about right there. To know that one day he's going to establish his kingdom. He's going to set up his kingdom. And he's finally going to overcome his enemies. In the end, there must come a universe in which he is supreme. How that will come is not ours to know. But it may be that this final overcoming will consist not in the extinction of his enemies, but in their submission to his love. It just might be that God's holding out just long enough to get those ones that you thought would never make it. The Lord to give them one last appeal, and they surrender. You just don't know. 
See, we don't, we, we're we praying, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And, and we're saying, why ain't you coming yet, God? You should have already come. Look at the hell that's going on in the world. You should have already come. Listen, he, he's still waiting on your husband. He's still waiting on your son. He's still waiting on your daughter. That one that's lost, he knows if I extend the time just a little bit, they're going to come to know me, and I'm willing to wait on them. I'm willing to be long-suffering for them. I'm willing to hold it out and give you strength to endure the fight just to see their soul saved. Listen, you don't understand this plan. I I don't understand his plan, but I know and trust that God has got my best interest in mind, but he's also not willing that anybody should perish. So if he's extending the day, let him extend the day, because you or I shouldn't want anybody to die and go to hell. You got family members. You got loved ones. You don't want them to die. You don't want them to go to hell. And God just might be extending the day, because he realizes in his omniscience, it's coming a day that they're going to break. They're going to yield. They're going to fall on their knee before God and cry out for mercy, and he's going to give it. Remember, in that last day, in that outpouring of the Spirit, all that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's good news. If you had loved ones that are lost, that that ought to encourage you right there. You ought to say, God, I'll hold on a little while longer if that's what it's going to take. If my loved ones come to know you, then God, I'll endure this tribulation. I'll go through this trial. I'll deal with this mess in this world. I, I begged you to come, but God, if it means my loved ones going to come to know you, then I'll hold on a little bit longer just so they come to know you as Savior. It's all be worth it for that, folks. See, it's not so much the power, but the love of God which conquers in the end. While we were yet sinners, Christ still died for us. By this, God commended his love toward us. It's God's love. Listen, I love his power, but I'm overwhelmed by his love. I love the move of his spirit. I love to see him heal. I love to see him deliver, but I am overwhelmed by his love. When I think about as wretched of a sinner as I was, listen, I can't talk about anybody else in the room, and I don't talk privately about it at all. When I think about how wretched I was, listen, I was born into this thing. I was born in a church. I, 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 all I've ever known is church. And yet I still turned away from God and I ran. And I did crazy stuff. But yet to think that God's love still chased me down and arrested my soul. I'm sorry, folks, but I, I'm telling you, I've been in Pentecost all my life, and I thank God for the ability to to shout and, 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 and feel the anointing and my hair stand up and goosebumps and all that stuff. But when I think about God so loved me, God so loved me that he gave his son for me that if I would believe in him, I should not perish but have everlasting life. Now listen, that's, that's the way I make John 3.16 personal, that God so loved me. Think about that for a moment. You should be in hell, but God so loved you that he gave his son just for you. That's the final triumph of what he did. His love is going to conquer in the end. Finally, as the habit of the Hebrew writer is, he clinches his argument with a quotation from Scripture. Jeremiah is speaking of the new covenant that's about to come. and He talks about how it not be imposed from the outside, but it will be written on the heart. And this is the way he ends in Jeremiah 31 and 34. He said, I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Because of what Jesus did, the barrier of sin is forever taken away. Think about that, folks. He said, their sins... And their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. That's enough to dwell on for about three days right there. Just to think about all the stuff you did. And God says, when you ask me to forgive, I'm not holding it against you. I'm not binding it on your heart any longer. I've loosed you from it. I've let it go. I've forgotten it. And I'm not remembering against you any more. Fornicator, adulterer, lustful, 
gambler. I'm talking about me. God says, I hold it to your charge no longer. <laughs> you might have been a drug addict. God says, it's washed. You might have been a prostitute. God said, it's washed. You might have, listen, I could, I could go on label, label, label. Whatever your lot in life was, when God found you, God says, it's washed and it's forgiven. It's forgiven. I will remember them no more. Can we go in prayer just on that thought right there? And I don't know about you, but I just want to have a time of prayer of thankfulness. Maybe you've just recollected what it was that you used to be. Sometimes I believe religious folks forget exactly what they were saved from. I thank God for what I was saved to, okay? I, and, and I think that's good. But sometimes I think religious folks forget what they were saved from. That it, was, that it was by grace that you were saved. That it was not because of how good you were or what great things you did. It was because of a loving God that saved you and washed you. So when I think about what I was saved from, the Bible talks about how that compels me to do good works for the Father. It constrains my heart, grips my thinking. When I think about He was able to forgive me of all that. Baby Mason, who is a professor down in Georgia at, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the school she's a professor, but she's got some songs out that she's sang. This has been a while back. She had one song, and I, and, and I remember it because uh, a lady I used to call Mama Reese I used to travel with when I was at college. Mama Reese used to sing this song. and No, it was Danielle that sang this song. I'm sorry. Mama Reese sang another one. Danielle uh, Etheridge, who actually came here and, and sang one Wednesday night. But Danielle sang this song. They said, after all I've done, you still loved me. Wow. After all I've done, you still Love me. He said, your sins and your lawless deeds I will remember no more. Father, thank you. Thank you that though my skins be as scarlet, they are whiter than snow. Thank you, Lord, that you've taken my transgressions and removed them far from me as far as the east is from the west. Never to be remembered against me anymore. I want to thank you for the supremacy of the sacrifice of what you did on the cross of Calvary. To purchase my salvation. To buy me eternal life. And I have been bought with that price and I am not my own. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. See, nobody in this room, not even my wife, understand the fullness of what you did in my life. And people could call me whatever they want to call me, but God, when I think about the grace and mercy and where you brought me from and what you've done to get me to this point here, and I know you're not done with me yet, but Lord, what you've done so far is mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling. And God, I just thank you today. I praise your holy name, Jesus. Help us all to understand the vastness of your love and your grace and your mercy. Help us all, God, to, to be more appreciative when we wake up in the morning and we lay down at night. The fact that you kept us, sustained us, protected us, delivered us, directed us. God, all these great things that you've done for us, God. Thank you. We give you glory and honor. I thank you for these that are here tonight. I thank you for the demonstration of your love and your grace, God, that you've poured out on them, that they could have a deeper understanding of what you've done. Just the achievement and the, and the exaltation of what you did and just the triumph of what you accomplished on that cross. That sacrifice once and for all. Father, I give you praise, glory, and honor for that tonight. Thank you for the ultimate picture of, of triumph that you have sat down at the right hand of God, declaring once again, it is finished. Keep us in your care. 
Help us to look to you always. Help us to do all we do to do it for your glory. And we'll give all the praise, the glory, and the honor to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say it. Amen. Do you love the Lord? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great night. Take a moment fellowship with one another. I love you so much. Appreciate you.